A very good morning to everyone and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off mobile phones and other devices to silent as they may disrupt the meeting. Uh, no apologies have been received for today's meeting. And if I turn to agenda item one, which is the draft budget scrutiny for 2018-19. And uh, welcome to the committee this morning, Jean Freeman, Minister for Social Security, James Wallace, Head of Finance, Graham Lockhart, Head of Platforms and Technologies, and Merlin Kemp, Team Leader, Housing Benefit Reform and Affordability, Scottish Government. Whilst the budget briefing materials provided to the committee have covered areas which members have expressed an interest, such as council tax reduction and employability programmes, these do fall outside the remit of the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Securities and Equalities, so the may, Minister may um, not feel able to respond fully to those questions So, if they come up as they've been provided in the papers. Um, so I would like to invite the Minister to give her opening statement. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to everybody. Um, could I just take a couple of minutes to, uh, to start to put on record at the committee uh, my thanks to Sandra White, uh, previous convener, uh, for all the work she has done on, particularly on the Social Security uh, in particular. And can I also take this opportunity to welcome you, Ms Adamson, to your new role. I look forward to working with you. Um, uh, on the specifics of uh, why we're here this morning, uh, let me say that following last week's publication of the draft budget, members will be aware of the community social security and equalities portfolio's focus on our overarching aims to create a fairer Scotland, to support inclusive growth, tackle inequalities, uh, promote community empowerment and the participation of people in all aspects of Scottish life. Through the budget, we as a government have continued to prioritise funding to support our major expansion of affordable housing to reach our 50,000 affordable homes target in this parliamentary term, tackle fuel poverty and support our targets on climate change, regenerate, strengthen and empower our communities, support the third sector and develop social enterprise, promote equality, continue our efforts to tackle poverty and inequality, and continue to mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cuts. And of course, continue our work on policy and operational plans for the delivery of the 11 devolved benefits with our new social security powers. Key points for the portfolio in the draft budget include the introduction of a tackling child poverty fund worth 50 million pounds, an investment of 20 million in the empowering communities fund, to tackle poverty and inequality, and a continued priority of community engagement to advance equality within Scotland. Within the Social Security budget, we will make funding transfers to local authorities, supporting the continuation of the Scottish Welfare Fund, a proven necessary provision to support those who find themselves in emergency financial situations, and we are continuing to fully fund uh, discretionary housing payments. This is to enable us to mitigate losses affecting over 70,000 households as a result of the bedroom tax implemented by the UK Government. Members will be aware that the Scottish Fiscal Commission has prepared forecasts to accompany the budget and will see that in relation to DHPs, we have utilised the FCA, FC, SFC forecast in full, allocating £62 million, an increase of £12 million, that's 24%, since 2016-17. Similarly, for the Scottish Welfare Fund, we've utilised a forecast of 33 million, maintaining the value of the fund. Now, the Fiscal Commission have forecast that in 2018-19, an additional one million pounds may be required for the mitigation of the UK government's reduction in assistance for housing for 18 to 21 year olds. We will monitor whether this requirement materialises and will make additional funding available to the Scottish Welfare Fund if it is required. As in 2017-18, the Social Security Programme will continue uh, in 18-19 to draw on a level four budget of 75 million held within the finance and constitution portfolio for Scotland Act 2016 implementation. This approach allows us to continue to adapt quickly through implementation to effectively meet evolving policy circumstances and expectations. We have not made budget 
available for payment of benefits in advance of parliamentary scrutiny of the Social Security Scotland Bill being complete. As executive competence for the benefits to be devolved transfers to the Scottish Government, we will make available budget as required. Executive competence transfers in future will trigger block grant adjustments, providing the funding to make budget available. These transfers and associated forecast expenditure will then need to be reflected in the Scottish budget. The timing of the addition to the budget will depend on when the benefit is devolved. For example, if a benefit were devolved mid-year, we would expect a block grant adjustment and the associated budget to be reflected through the Scottish Government in-year budget revision process. This addition would then be scrutinised by the Finance Committee and approved by Parliament. So while therefore it is not possible to allocate funding for specific benefits until the Social Security Bill is passed, I can confirm, as the uh, Finance Secretary uh, said, that additional funding will be allocated in year to support the landmark step of increasing the carer's allowance in the financial year 1819. The increase will be delivered by the summer of 2018 and backdated to April of that year. Alongside the bill, this past year has seen other positive developments in the Social Security programme, including our recruitment of 2,400 volunteers to the experience panels, the decision on our agency location with its headquarters in Dundee and a major centre in Glasgow, together with locally based Social Security staff across Scotland, the awarding of a two-year contract to IBM UK to build the first phase of the new Social Security IT system to deliver the initial set of benefits we've announced, and of course, stage one debate on Tuesday, for which I again want to record my thanks to this committee. All of that informed by our continuous engagement with key stakeholders, our expert advisory group, our experience panels, and with members and committees in this parliament. As part of our transparent approach, we recently sent this committee a copy of the detail we provided to the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, breaking down the 190 million high-level estimate cost of IT implementation that's contained in the financial memorandum attached to the Social Security Bill. I hope this breakdown has assisted members to see how our, in, our initial estimate uh, has been built up for IT, and I've committed to provide further regular updates on IT implementation, which will allow me to share with the committee how actual implementation costs compare with these initial estimates over time. As we continue our work, we do, of course, need to remember the important part our relationship with the Department for Work and Pensions will play throughout the devolution process. Our shared and effective work is critical to delivery. The relationship is reinforced by our forums for resolution, providing an opportunity to discuss any issues which may arise at either the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which deals with policy-related issues, or the Joint Exchequer Committee, which deals with financial issues. This committee, of course, will continue to have oversight of these forums, and my officials and I will make sure members are kept abreast of developments as we make progress. My thanks to you, convener, for the opportunity to say uh, these few uh, opening remarks, uh, and I'm more than happy to now take questions as assisted by my officials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, the new social security system obviously has um, is, is a large undertaking. Um, it's setting up a new agency, new IT systems. There's partnership working, as you've already said, with the DWP and councils that are going to be um, key to this. Um, at this stage, can I just ask how well that's progressing as obviously delays will incur costs? And um, just to get a general idea of things going well and, and to schedule at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. We, we have um, in the Social Security Directorate and I review monthly uh, a regular risks update against the overall plan for implementation. As I know members in this committee uh, appreciate, there are a number of parallel work streams uh, all working, um, led by the incremental approach to uh, taking responsibility for the uh, individual benefits. Uh, we've announced the first three that we will uh, assume responsibility for uh, following uh, agreement on, by Parliament on the bill. And those incremental taking of responsibility is paralleled by an incremental build 
uh, of, uh, in terms of the agency, the uh, infrastructure that sits uh, beneath that agency to support it, which includes, of course, IT, but not exclusively IT, therefore the recruitment uh, uh, of staff and the work that is going on uh, now completed um, initially with uh, local authorities and with health to look at the different models we might adopt around the country for our local social security staff. So at the moment, we continue to be on track uh, to meet our commitment uh, to take responsibility for all the benefits in the lifetime of this parliament. Uh, there are various phases in that approach, uh, but as I said, there is a regular check by me uh, every month with the senior directorate team, which covers all those areas. There is also internally in uh, the uh, civil service a programme board uh, and, of course, our regular meetings at the joint ministerial group. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, can I open it up to committee members? My Bring in Ms Maguire. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask a bit about the fiscal framework. I think it would be helpful um, if you could explain the interaction between the fiscal framework and the social security system and whether you believe it's um, working. And then, more specifically, how will in-year um, budget adjustments take place if governed by the fiscal framework? Is it flexible enough um, to ensure that we can deliver the benefits we want to and, and meet policy objectives? OK. Uh, if you don't mind, I will be assisted in this um, by Mr Wallace um, in terms of the, the um, uh, detailed workings of the fiscal framework and in-year budget adjustments. I think one of the important things, though, for me to say in terms of the fiscal framework is that we continue as a government to believe that it is uh, a fair agreement that will work uh, for us uh, and for the UK government in terms of the devolution of the benefits. Of course, the, the amounts of money agreed uh, in terms of the contribution UK government will make on implementation and on uh, delivery costs uh, is a share of the costs. It's, it's not expected to be, uh, and part of the agreement is that it is a share. Um, and so uh, we understand very well what those numbers are and how they sit against our estimate uh, of what the overall cost will be for implementation and continued delivery. So we remain uh, content with the fiscal framework and its uh, adequacy to allow us to meet the responsibilities uh, we currently have and will assume. Um, but if I may, I pass to Mr Wallace to talk you through the in-year adjustments and how those work. Um, I'm happy to, to tell you about that. Um, I think the, the fiscal framework, I think it's appropriate to say, is not just for Social Security, so it covers a range of powers. Um, in some areas, the, the mechanisms described in the framework are new. Um, we haven't used them before, um, so we are breaking new ground in some areas. Um, but it, 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 it is seeming to be a fairly flexible arrangement at the moment. Um, we, we speak regularly with our, our, our colleagues in, in uh, Her Majesty's Treasury um, to discuss exactly how the, the interactions between the UK government and, and, the, and, the, and the UK government are going to work in terms of funding transfers. Um, the, the committee will probably be aware the, the block grant adjustment is initially based on the year prior to devolution, so year zero as it were, um, where the OBR will make a forecast of um, benefit expenditure. Um, the initial block grant adjustment for the Scottish Government will be calculated based on that year zero figure. Um, then the year zero figure will be reconciled to DWP outturn in year one um, and in year zero. Um, and then a, a reconciling adjustment will be made to our block grant. Um, the, the block grant adjustment will be indexed every year, um, as happens at the moment to block grant adjustment. So we, we look to comparable areas of UK government expenditure um, to decide what consequentials are required, positive or negative. Um, the, there is then the opportunity to have in-year adjustments to that block grant. Um, and I think this is, this is the, for me, the area that's slightly different to how other block grant adjustments may work. For example, for tax, taxes always begin generally on the on the 1st of April in any year. So we are in good time for the for the draft budget statement to make a block grant adjustment with social security devolution. That may not always be the case. Um, uh, the, the, uh, unless a benefit 
is devolved on the 1st of April, we will probably not be in time to agree a block grant adjustment in time for the draft budget statement, which will require a, an in-year adjustment to the block grant. I, I think it's fair to say that wasn't what was envisaged when the fiscal framework was agreed. Um, I, don't, I think because it's new ground, n no one quite understood the, the slightly differing mechanics that would be required um, to allow a, an in-year adjustment to a block grant to happen. Um, as I say, that is something we're discussing with Treasury about how, how will we actually make this work in practice. Um, it, 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 because it's new ground and because we're only in the first wave, we've never done it before. So the, 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 the groundwork that we lay this year with Treasury will, will allow this process to be, to be very smooth in future years. And that's not to say it's not smooth at the moment. We're, we're working very well with Treasury um, to, to apply the mechanics of the fiscal framework. Mark, but it, 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 it's a timing issue, really. The, 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 the actual mechanics of the block grant happen every single year for the Scottish Government. Um, the, the, the reconciliations happen every single year. Um, and the, I think the key point for me is that, that, that there is some flexibility through the end-year adjustments, um, which is, is really quite helpful from a financial management perspective, particularly when it's not an income-based adjustment that you're dealing with, um, that it's an expenditure-based adjustment. So if, if the year zero for, uh, if the year's year for forecast proves to be below, um, the Scottish Government financial management arrangements will be supported by those in-year adjustments to make sure there's top-ups to the block grant, essentially, to, to meet our in-year expenditure, um, which minimises that some of the risk around uh, cash management to the Scottish Government. Can, can I just, just add, I, I know that committee members are very familiar from previous uh, discussions about the um, regular, sometimes um, twice daily, if not more frequent contact between social security officials working um, uh, in terms of, of our programme and DWP officials. I think it's worth saying that there is a comparable contact on a regular basis between our finance officials and, and those in Treasury and elsewhere. Uh, across government, as Mr Wallace said, it's not simply about social security um, in terms of operationalising that fiscal framework. I think the other point just to make, uh, in case members are uh, in any sense a little bit anxious, um, and that is that the driver for delivery, in other words, the driver um, for us on when we take responsibility for the individual benefits is based entirely on our readiness to assume that responsibility uh, in terms of the agency's readiness, the IT system and so on. So the driver is not how close is it to the start of a financial year in order to, to help um, with that, although we wouldn't want, obviously, to um, cause unnecessary difficulties to our finance colleagues. But the driver always has to be that we are ready, according to the plan and with everything else in place, to assume the delivery of benefit X or Y, uh, making sure that people who are in receipt of it will continue to receive the money they're entitled to. Thank you. That, that is helpful. May I just yes. <laughs> briefly? Um, uh, here, um, obviously, the, the, the two agencies are working well together, but is there potential for conflict? Because, I mean, it is very complex. It's new, as, as we mentioned. I mean, what, what are the, the risks around this? Yeah. Um, if I can just mention just, just one of the, the points. As you would understand, um, it is a wee while since the negotiations happened and the agreement was reached on the fiscal framework. Inevitably, um, across uh, the civil service, both here in Scotland and at Whitehall, uh, individuals move on um, and move on to other posts, become promoted or whatever. Uh, and so sometimes, uh, and uh, there have been a couple of occasions where we have had to go back and help people understand what the thinking was and the actual agreement was mm -hmm. around particular aspects of the fiscal framework. Um, members will recall, I think, um, a previous uh, discussion here on a policy matter around the application of the benefit cap. Now, some of that um, is not maliciously intended mm -hmm. to create a difficulty. It's simply that not everyone sitting around the table and in those discussions was there at the time when the agreement was reached mm -hmm. and uh, therefore uh, read it on the page and don't necessarily uh, interpret it the way it was intended at the point when it was first reached. And I think that can apply. Uh, Mr Wallace clearly will be able to 
uh, add any detail to that. That can apply in terms of the overall fiscal framework and how we work uh, those financial arrangements and how you categorise different areas of cost um, in terms of how they are then seen by Treasury or whoever. I, 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 I agree with what the Minister has said. Um, I, I think there, there, there can be quirks. There, there, are, there are new issues in here. Um, I, I think from, from my perspective, working within the programme and, and, and dealing with Treasury and dealing with uh, the, the DWP, um, relations are, are good. Um, it is in everyone's interest to make devolution work. Um, and that is a, a major factor in, in the discussions that we have. We may have points of, of, of disagreement, we may have different viewpoints, but we, we work through those professionally. Um, and I, I think uh, the, the, the fact that everyone wants to see this work um, adds a real driver behind it to make sure that we do come to agreements and sensible, pragmatic solutions where, where the, the fiscal framework, for example, throws up quirks that we might not have expected. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Polly McNeil? It was just a, um, that, that, that was very helpfully set out. Um, it's just a quick question in relation to uh, part of a brief. Um, so the Social Security Committee costs are no longer included in this portfolio. Instead, they're included in the Scotland Act 2016 non-tax implementation uh, in the Finance and Constitution portfolio. Is the reason for that, what you've just described, it's because it's a question of the fiscal framework? And the reason I wanted to get that clarified is I think it's quite important going forward that the committee, uh, would certainly, I would be certainly wanting assurances um, from you that in future years that the committee can question or to <coughs> question to understand it, the, the, the finances around the fiscal framework as it will affect the Social Security budget. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's not dissimilar to last year. Uh, and as Mr Wallace said, the, um, the fiscal framework covers more than um, Social Security. Uh, so it covers uh, the powers that were devolved as a consequence uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the Smith Commission and so on. And so that all sits at the moment uh, within that other portfolio. And we draw down from that, as I said, we draw down uh, in terms of implementation as we go. However, um, from next year, um, it is our intention, once the Social Security Bill is approved by the Parliament in whatever form it then approves it, then we will begin to uh, deliver uh, th those first three benefits that we uh, announced not, not so long ago. The one uh, definitely in the current fina or the financial year we're looking at, 1819, is the carer's supplement, uh, and that's when the, the transfer is made over. So uh, we need the legislative basis to make that payment. We need DWP to transfer the competence for carer's allowance to us, so that we can pay the supplement, uh, and then you will begin to see uh, in uh, the social security uh, lines of the of the draft budget. Um, the, those amounts of money. Uh, as Mr Mackay said, he will make that available in-year. That then becomes an in-year budget adjustment to, to the Scottish Government's budget, scrutinised by Finance Committee, approved by Parliament. And as we take responsibility for each of the benefits, then you'll continue to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring in Mr <clears throat> Griffin? I just wanted to ask a few questions around the Scottish Welfare Fund. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, was around the, the value of the fund. And the SPICE figures um, indicate that the proposed budget, um, in comparison to the budget in 13-14, rep represents a real terms cut of £2.5 million. Pounds, and from last year to this year's proposed budget, represents a real terms cut of £600,000. I just wanted to ask whether there was any consideration to maintaining the fund in real terms against the backdrop of the, the implementation of universal credit and all the difficulties in the, the committees heard around that and a, an increase in crisis grant applications of, of 11%. Um, so thank you very much for the question. I, I think what we have done overall is look at how um, uh, demands have been made on that fund 
and anticipated in terms of both uh, its use uh, for crisis grants and for uh, community support, uh, how we can best maintain that. Um, at the moment, um, the overall agreement we have reached is, is what is in the budget. Um, we have always, of course, said in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund that we continue to review with local government the demands that are placed on it and maintain a position of being able, if, if we can and if the need is there, of returning to see whether we can apply any additional funds as the year progresses. And looking at it and trying to predict um, the, the demand on that budget, was there any particular attention paid to those areas where universal credit has already been rolled out and the demands on the welfare fund in, lo in those particular areas to try and project uh, forward um, as it rolls out across the country? Yeah, the, the, <coughs> the um, Scottish Welfare Fund is, uh, as I understand it, allocated in terms of the COSLA formula. Yes. Um, and whilst you have a point, you'll, you'll know as well as I do, um, Mr Griffin, that um, both Citizens Advice and indeed local authorities have produced um, uh, important evidence about the impact of the rollout of universal credit uh, on peaks in demand um, on the, the welfare fund. Uh, but nonetheless, it is allocated on the basis of a formula agreed between Scottish Government and COSLA, which applies across the board. Now, we continue to have discussions with COSLA about how <clears throat> the fund, whether that remains uh, an adequate basis on, of allocating the fund, or whether or not there is a, the option of looking at a different approach which responds to where there are peaks in demand uh, as a consequence uh, perhaps of some of those matters like the rollout of universal credit. But <clears throat> the overall fund uh, or the <coughs> overall formula for allocation is uh, applies across uh, local government, Scottish government allocation to local government across a number of areas. So making um, uh, a difference for one aspect of it um, carries implications that, of course, COSLA has to have a real good think about uh, before it would uh, consider moving in that direction. But we do continue to have those conversations with them about whether or not the formula is adequate to the different demands placed on local, different local authorities as a consequence of those circumstances. Okay, thanks for that. You, you mentioned <coughs> the, the potential increase demand on the, the fund because of the, the government's um, intervention on housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. There is also um, a new demand being put on the fund with a, a new commitment to a, a family reunion crisis grant. Um, I wonder what consideration has been given to the cost of that when it's come to setting the budget for the Scottish Welfare Fund. And also you mentioned the figure of um, a projected 1 million costs for the 18 to 21 year old housing benefit um, section that the SPICE figures have said that if there, are, if there, are, if there is a 100 per cent uptake, that could cost up to £3 million. Um, I wonder if um, you've made allowances for that and the potential costs of that provision. <clears throat> so on, on 18 to 20, this is 18 to 21 yep. year old housing benefits. The um, Scottish Fis Fiscal Commission um, forecast that it would be, it could require an additional £1 million. Pounds. And as I said in my opening remarks, um, we will keep that under review. But to date, in the interim solution that we've put in place, uh, only three individuals have required the, the support uh, through that interim solution. Now, in part, that comes because as individuals come to uh, local authorities, 18 to 21-year-olds, looking for that support in terms of housing benefit, um, the work that is then done um, uh, discovers that they would fit into one of the UK government's exemption categories, and so they continue to receive the support uh, through that route. So, so far, um, we have only supported directly three individuals. So we have um, noted the Fiscal Commission's forecast. Um, we remain ready to increase the, the amount of money should that uh, be required. But we do not, on the basis of the evidence of three so far, agree that £1 million should be allocated under that heading at this point. Um, and I should say that the money that we've um, allocated to the Scottish Welfare Fund um, does take the Fiscal Commission's 
uh, forecast for that into account as well. Can you just remind me what the other part of your the, question the, was? The other new commitment to the, the fund was the new Family fund. Reunion Crisis Grant, um, which is supposed to be coming online towards the end of this, this year, um, just to see what additional demands were expected to put on the fund and whether any financial figure had been set, set aside to cover that demand. Right. If you forgive me, I'm, I am not in a position at the minute to answer that question, but I, I will undertake to do so and come back to you uh, by the end of today. Okay. Finally, Kimbira, my last question was um, around the fund in previous year. Eight local authorities used their own funds to, to top up the Scottish Welfare Fund, and given the, the position that local authorities are in with this financial settlement, it, it may prove much more difficult for those eight to continue with that. Um, and aside from the commitment to um, step in within year adjustments to cover the 18 to 21 um, housing benefit provision, uh, would the government step in with in year provisions to update, um, up, increase the budget um, if? It, there was such a demand there as a result of universal credit and uh, increased applications. Well, <clears throat> of course, we've not finalised, we've not reached as, as a parliament a final position on the budget. Uh, and I'm sure there will be continued discussions with respect to local government and other areas. Um, but uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund is a really important uh, part for us and for this portfolio in terms of how we mitigate the worst effects uh, of uh, UK government welfare cuts and we are open to continued discussion with uh, local authorities through COSLA uh, where there are additional demands and issues that they raise with us that require additional support and we would continue to look at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Balfour, is it a supplementary in uh, this area? I was going back to the first question, supplementary. That's fine, okay. that's fine. Yep. <clears throat> uh, uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, just going back to the budget halfway through the year being devolved, does that mean when different benefits are devolved, the payments people get will be the same in Scotland as in the rest of the United Kingdom? Or will, and if there's differential payments or more people get that, how will that be accounted for in, in uh, say, if it happens in June? For that, for the rest of that financial period, or is it that everyone will stay in the same amount of money as they were before the power was transferred? Right. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, yes, I think it. I think it. Well, you tell me if my answer makes sense, um, and whether I've answered your question uh, properly or not. So, in terms, with the exception of where, as a government, we have made manifesto commitments to increase the level of uh, financial support, for example, um, in the change from Sure Start Grant to Best Start Grant. Um, with the exception of those benefits, um, th what an individual will receive um, when the responsibility is transferred to the Scottish Government will be the level of the benefit they are currently receiving. Um, where we are increasing uh, the financial spend on the benefit, then that is, not, that is not transferred to us from the UK government. Those are additional financial commitments that the Scottish government uh, has made uh, and will be accounted for uh, in future budgets uh, by uh, Mr Mackay uh, in terms of looking at how he allocates uh, spend across portfolios and produces the balanced budget that he needs to. So for the year that we're looking at just now, for 1819, uh, the... Uh, uh, <coughs> benefit that we will take responsibility for, uh, that uh, we know at this point will be in, in that financial year, uh, is the carer's allowance. Now, carer's allowance uh, will transfer, the competence for that needs to be transferred to us after the bill is passed. Uh, DWP will continue to deliver that carer's allowance uh, until we take delivery responsibility for it later in this parliamentary term, but initially in order to ensure that we can pay the increase that we want to pay to uh, carers, that supplement, as we're currently referring to it, will be paid uh, by Scottish Government through our delivery uh, agency, and that additional 
amount of money is not transferred to us from the UK government. That is uh, allocated by Mr Mackay, as he said he would do, uh, from the overall Scottish budget for that year. Uh, thank you, Minister. I think your answer was a lot better than my question. Um, <laughs> in regard to just going forward, um, obviously we don't know the regulations for the other, mm -hmm. and these will be published in due course. Um, will your officers or civil servants be doing modelling to see the uptake in regard to these different benefits, as in will more people be uptaking it unless there will be an extra cost? And will that be met by the UK government, or will that, if, if more people take up an award, will that be a cost that falls onto the Scottish government? OK. So there's two parts to that question. So modelling is quite hard to do in terms of benefit take-up because the baseline data is not there for all the benefits. Um, baseline data is UK data and it is uh, not held. So when we have had previous discussions about benefit uptake um, and we've uh, indicated an estimate there is about half a million people in uh, Scotland not receiving uh, some of the benefits that they're entitled to, that's quite a small number of benefits. And that's because that's the only data that is available. So it is difficult to model increase in uptake when you don't have a starting point. Uh, however, uh, so that's the first point. We, we will, um, through our new social security agency, attempt to create baseline data for Scotland um, so that we know um, what the uptake is for the benefits that we're responsible for and what we anticipate it ought to be and then uh, attempt to um, increase uptake so we close that particular gap but we, what we won't be starting from um, is a baseline figure that comes from the current uptake numbers on those benefits. Um, what is transferred to us in terms of the benefits that we will take responsibility for is, um, Mr. I'm sure Mr Wallace will correct me if I'm wrong here, is the amount of UK spend on those benefits in Scotland in the year before we take responsibility. So uh, if we then uh, successfully uh, increase uptake, uh, then that is clearly for the Scottish Government to find the resources to support that. Uh, and, it's a, and we understand that uh, as we uh, promote a benefit uptake campaign because our view is that people who are entitled to the benefits should know that they are, should have a fairly uh, easy and streamlined process for application and should receive what they're entitled to. But we're very conscious what we're dealing with here uh, over the piece is, of course, a demand-led uh, spend. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one that uh, has to then be managed by folks like Mr Wallace and others in terms of the risks around demand-led and being able to forecast ahead. But that, too, is where the Scottish Fiscal Commission's independent role is particularly helpful in its advanced forecasting. And I think it covers some of that in the report that it has produced for the current draft budget. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Can I bring in Mr Tompkins? Thank you, Camilla. Um, Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, I want to ask you about the Fairer Scotland budget, uh, which has increased by 303%. Why? <clears throat> well, part of that um, includes the uh, new uh, funds um, set aside to support the child poverty uh, bill Act. and sorry Act 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 <laughs> indeed thank you thank you Ms Constance will never forgive me for that um, we just correct that record if we may um, the child poverty act uh, and additional uh, monies in terms of empowering communities and so on we've also um, increased the equalities uh, budget uh, and uh, maintained some of the other areas and all of that is because the um, commitment to the Fairer Scotland Action Plan is a solid one on the part of this government. And um, those uh, discussions in terms of the overall budget and uh, this portfolio within that um, have uh, held true to that commitment. Indeed. I'm glad you mentioned the Equalities Budget as well. Is that on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you mentioned the Equalities Budget as well, because that has increased by £2.5 million in addition to the increase in the Fairer Scotland Budget. I mean, would I be right in presuming that uh, some of the budget um, under the Fairer Scotland line um, is going to go towards the um, uh, preparation and the delivery of the first delivery plan under the um, <coughs> Child Poverty Act? 
Yes, yeah, so the, the delivery plan um, is due to be published by April 2018, uh, and clearly there, um, there has to be resourcing behind that, so the £50 million uh, fund is, is there, but also um, we have asked the, uh, the new uh, Poverty uh, and Equalities Commission to advise us on that delivery plan, and we have an, uh, an expectation that there will be specific actions that they will require us or recommend that we should take. So you say the £50 million pound figure, it's not £50 million for this year, it's £27.8 million for this year. Um, how's that number calculated? I mean, how, how, how do we know, how do you know, that you, you, you need an additional 303%, not an additional, I don't know, 200% or 500% on that budget, when you don't yet know what the delivery plan is going to include? Well, because you draw on the work of uh, organisations like Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the work that we currently do in terms of tackling poverty and the discussions with our stakeholders to see where uh, we can make additional interventions that will make a difference in terms of the numbers of people in Scotland uh, who are in poverty. And from that, you make a forward estimate uh, of what you anticipate you will require. Um, you then uh, work with the Commission and others to specify specific actions that will take you towards the targets that are contained in that new Act. Uh, uh, final question for me. I mean, how are we to, in future years, assess um, the efficiency and effect effectiveness of this, of, of this budget? Would it, be, would it be fair, for example, for us to use... The, um, the uh, Scotland Performs Update, which is one of the documents that's published alongside the budget, was published last week, um, which has um, in its Social Security Committee chapter a list of 15 performance indicators or measurements, um, and performance is improving. This is the Scottish Government's own analysis. Under the Scottish Government's own analysis, performance is, is improving in only three out of 15 indicators. So performance is not improving in terms of reducing underemployment, increasing the proportion of young people in learning, training or work, increasing the proportion of graduates in positive destinations, improving support for people with care needs, improving people's perceptions of the quality of public services, improving the responsiveness of public services, reducing children's deprivation, directly relevant to child poverty, increasing the number of new homes and so on and on. In none of those areas is the Scottish Government's performance improving. Next year, when we look at um, the uh, um, Scotland Performs update, um, will we be able to see whether there is a direct relationship between this £27.8 million of public money that's being devoted to Fairer Scotland this year um, and, a, and performance improving in some of these uh, areas which at the moment are not improving? Would that be a fair way for the committee to proceed? Well, I, th I think, Mr Tompkins, you're being a little unfair in terms of your interpretation of uh, those performance figures. I don't have them with me, but from memory... Uh, many of the areas that you've just read out, performance is being maintained. Uh, and if I recall correctly, there are only two areas in the performance uh, set where performance has declined. Yeah, three. Uh, three. Uh, and so, uh, and if I recall again correctly, some of those areas, it would be reasonable to say performance has declined as a consequence of factors that are out with the control or the powers of this government. So, I'm not complacent about our performance, but I think your description of it is a little unfair. And for the record, we should note that there are a number of areas where performance is maintained. Now, to get back to your, the substance of your point, yes, I do think that um, when the committee comes to look at um, the effective use of expenditure in the future, it will, of course, look at those performance uh, statistics, which as a government we produce for the very reasons that th our performance can be judged uh, in, in that basis. But also, we, you would be looking uh, over the piece at how uh, we perform as a government in terms of meeting uh, the very specific targets that the uh, Child Poverty Act sets out and at how we are performing in meeting the, expend the actual expenditure against the estimates that we've produced, for example, in the finance memorandum attached to the Social Security Bill. So there's more than one place to look and determine whether or not we are securing best value for money, uh, whether our uh, forecasts and estimates have been uh, accurate, uh, and whether or not our performance is being maintained or is improving, or in uh, some uh, circumstances perhaps where we need to do better.
Thank you. Okay. Um, can I bring in Mr. McPherson? <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Uh, you made reference in your opening statement to the Stage 1 debate we had on Tuesday earlier this week. And one of the issues that I, I raised in that debate was around uh, DHPs, discretionary housing payments. And so I'll just have some um, questions around that in terms of the budget. The, I've noticed from the f uh, analysing the figures that the DHP budget seems to have been significantly increased over the past three years, going from 35 million in 2016-17 to a total of 61 million, uh, well, sorry, 62 million in 18-19, uh, with an additional 1.2 million for admin. I just wondered if you could explain the the, re the reasoning for this. For the increase. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the increase is is partly b based in terms of the f the forecasts, and you know you'll know that a large part of the DHP budget goes to mitigate the bedroom tax uh, and so the demands on on uh, on us to do that uh, and in addition uh, we have uh, included uh, other areas where DHPs uh, can help individuals uh, in terms of uh, what is required the admin costs come from uh, local authorities uh, in terms of what they tell us it costs them to administer uh, this benefit on our behalf um, th thank you for that. So uh, it's particularly interesting to, to, to get clarity on the 1.2 million for the admin. Um, you mentioned the, the bedroom tax and the 70,000 households that have been affected by this. Uh, has there been a solution uh, agreed with the DWP on paying the bedroom tax? And if so, what difference will this make to DHPs and budget lines in the future? <coughs> Excuse me. So. You will recall, as I'm sure other members do, um, that our starting point um, was to mitigate the bedroom tax at source. Uh, and the initial uh, area of difference that we had with DWP was their interpretation that if that was done, uh, and therefore for any individual, um, the consequence in terms of what they received in benefit took them over the benefit cap, the UK government's benefit cap, they would impose the benefit cap. And uh, that was not our understanding uh, of the overall agreement uh, as that came as a consequence of the Smith Commission and then the fiscal framework. So um, we have now resolved that and therefore those individuals uh, will not be penalised in that way. What we're doing now is working through the, the technical solution to that policy solution so that as universal credit is rolled out, we can um, mitigate the bedroom tax at source and so the individual does not have to apply to local authority for the DHP support in order to uh, mitigate the bedroom tax by that route. Um, what that means though is that, the, um, that we then pay DWP uh, so the monies that you see in DH, the DHP line uh, that are set against the mitigating the bedroom tax uh, are funds that will then go to the, DA, to the DWP to compensate them for the income that they would not receive. Um, now that will, you will start to see that across both lines actually because um, uh, we're mitigating the bedroom tax at source within universal credit so as universal credit is rolled out, then the monies come out of the DHP line and go into um, a line that would say we're paying the DWP here. Um, but in the interim, you'll see it in both places. Does that make sense? It does, and, it, and it's helpful to, to know that for, for future years of analysis and that that action is, is being taken. The, Moving towards just one last question, if I may convener, on, on um, other DHP funding. Um, the, I wondered if uh, there's been consideration whether funding for other DHP uh, between local authorities will be the same or, or differentiated in, in the years ahead, given the variations in the private rental market across Scotland. And the reason I ask that is an Edinburgh MSP is that the, the PRS in Scotland and it's in, in, in the city in, in Edinburgh and its relationship with, say, for example, the bedroom tax has, has caused difficulty for constituents of mine. Yeah, I understand that. Um, and um, you know that, that in the current 
uh, or in the proposed budget line in the draft budget, something like £10.9 million pounds is, is there un, in, under the DHP heading um, to help um, those affected by uh, welfare reform, including the benefit cap and uh, local housing allowance. Um, and it's very similar, I guess my answer is very similar to the answer I gave to Mr Griffin, and that is that the agreement between um, Scottish Government and COSLA in terms of how uh, funds to local authorities are uh, dispersed um, sits on that formula uh, with COSLA. And um, I think from, from my perspective, it would be fair to say that, I, that we can see uh, differing needs across local authorities. Um, however, the formula is one that both um, Scottish Government and COSLA are committed to, mm -hmm. and that uh, does, whilst it takes account uh, in uh, some aspects of differing uh, circumstances across local authorities, um, there is, I think, room for further discussion about how uh, adequately that account is taken as we begin to see some of the discrepancies emerge that uh, you're referring to, and indeed, Mr Griffin referred to, but that is really for a discussion between my colleague Mr Stewart and Mr Mackay uh, and COSLA uh, to determine whether or not there can be any uh, discretion or changes in the formula in terms of whatever the different areas of spend that it is applied to. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, um, Ms Johnson. <coughs> yes. Um, <coughs> Thank you and good morning. And still on the, the, the subject of the DHP, I mean, Ben McPherson has pointed out that the draft budget proposes an increase in the DHP budget, but this is ring-fenced for bedroom tax mitigation. And the rest of the DHP budget line is flat in cash terms, so is in effect a real terms cut. Um, uh, CPAG Scotland have reported cases in which people who are eligible for DHP payments are being turned away because funding has run out and in addition we know that the new benefit cap is going to hit markedly more families than you know 3,700 potentially compared to only 500 under the previous version and so demand for DHPs will rise. I just wondered if you could explain why and I realise this is a draft proposal, it's a draft budget but is there any hope that this decision will be changed, will be reversed? Well, I have to answer that question, Ms Johnson, and I'm grateful to you for it, with, a, with a, a bit of context, which is a reminder mm -hmm. that in the 10 years to 2019-20, uh, the fiscal block grant to Scottish Government will be cut by £2.6 billion. Um, that is quite a sobering piece of context, I think, for us all to be mindful of. Can and I? therefore, any uh, requests to increase... Uh, uh, and any aspect of this portfolio budget, um, reasonable and understandable as they might be, has to be set in that context. Um, now, we as a government are, of course, always open to, uh, to those arguments. Uh, there are many, I know, around uh, areas on, of my particular remit in terms of social security, uh, and there are others, uh, but all of it has to, at the end of the day, produce a balanced budget. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> wholeheartedly share your frustration and I appreciate that ultimately this is the fault of the UK government but I think the Scottish government has you know you have uh, there's been a precedent for the Scottish government to to provide a safety net and I'm just concerned that this cannot be maintained if we look at these figures in front of us um, so I just wonder if negotiations are ongoing within the cabinet on this area mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right that there is a, pre a precedent um, for this government to provide a safety net as best as we can. And we retain in this draft budget our continued commitment to do that. I think the numbers bear that up. However, to be able to continue to do that in the face of that level of overall reduction, whence we're trying to uh, secure a balanced budget and do the other things that Mr Mackay outlined, not least uh, contribute to... Uh, additional support in education, economic growth, and so on and so forth, is a difficult balance to strike. And uh, securing additional funds in one area inevitably means that you reduce funds in another. Now, there will be continuing discussions, absolutely, um, uh, with other parties as we uh, work through this draft budget and look at uh, 
the other uh, demands uh, and suggestions that come forward before the budget is finally agreed and, no, agreed, and those discussions will, of course, take place in Cabinet. But at this point, I cannot make any additional uh, commitments to what is currently in the draft budget, which has secured an increase in this overall portfolio. Thank you. Um, can I move on to the subject of employability? DHPs? Yep, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to the subject of employability, if, if the Minister is um, able to answer questions on that issue. And I'm just wondering if the Social Security Agency will have any links to the Fair Start Scotland scheme. Uh, yes, we anticipate that it, that it will do. Uh, there are a number of early discussions uh, going on between myself and my colleague, Mr Hepburn, uh, and between uh, um, uh, David Wallace, who's uh, uh, leading on the establishment of the new agency, and his colleagues uh, in Mr Hepburn's portfolio, to look at uh, a number of areas uh, both in terms of making sure that local social security staff and others are fully aware of these uh, new devolved employability programmes, uh, but also looking at, if you like, ensuring that as we incrementally recruit, recruit to um, our new agency, that we uh, have as um, diverse and uh, equal opportunity-based uh, recruitment uh, policy and practice as we possibly can. And I know that a number of discussions have already taken place uh, in Dundee with different organisations working with individuals uh, who are preparing themselves for the labour market mm -hmm. uh, and indeed in Glasgow. And that will be picked up as we go around the different local authorities. Okay. Um, is the Minister aware of whether or not claimants of industrial injuries benefits will be eligible for the scheme? And, and if so, how they might be made aware of it? Uh, I'm not aware of that, but again, um, in terms of, you mean in terms of the uh, employability programme scheme, that scheme, I'm not aware of that, but again, uh, as with Mr Griffith, I undertake, Mr Griffin rather, I undertake to find the answer to that uh, and make sure that you get it before uh, the close today. Um, the, the second part of your question, oh, the other part, the other area I wanted to mention though, uh, was the new pilot programme um, that uh, is a joint Scottish Government and UK Government funded pilot programme, uh, which looks at um, creating an integrated hub uh, for individuals who uh, um, uh, become ill in terms of a long-term health condition uh, or a disability while still in employment in order to help them retain uh, employment as they recover. Uh, one of the uh, areas of concern for some time has been that when that happens to an individual, um, uh, perhaps uh, as they get a bit older, maybe they suffer a stroke or whatever, that, in order, that as they focus uh, on their health and their recovery uh, in that way, um, they fall out of employment when actually, uh, as they recover, employment sh remains an option and an opportunity for them. So what we're trying to do in the pilot programme is streamline the route um, for them, but also for the various uh, health and other agencies that are there to support them, so that, uh, and for the employers, so that the individual can uh, easily move back into work uh, if they're fit to do so, and that is what they want to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, can I just bring in Mr Tomkins in another area? Thanks. Thank you very much, convener. Um, uh, Minister, I just want to ask you about something that said um, by the Fiscal Commission in their um, report that was published on the same day as the budget. There's a paragraph 51 of the report. Um, uh, the Commission says this. To support the Scottish Parliament and the public in understanding and scrutinising the Scottish Government's policy proposals in um, uh, so Social Security, the Commission will aim to produce forecasts of expenditure to accompany subordinate legislation relating to any areas of our, of our remit. So this is about um, the fact that the Commission at the moment is able to forecast um, future Social Security expenditure only with regard to carers' allowance and one or two other uh, um, areas because the government has not yet published any proposals at all about who is going to be entitled to what with regard to attendance allowance or um, DLA and PIP and so on and so forth. So the Commission's words again are that the Commission will aim to produce forecasts of expenditure to accompany subordinate legislation 
what, what are we to do as a parliament if the commission is unable to realise that ambition? And is there anything that we could or should be doing, in your view, to convert that from an aim into a duty so that the commission is required to help the parliament understand the financial implications of the regulations as and when those regulations are produced? Well, let me say two things. Um, just for the record and to ensure there is no misunderstanding, uh, the particular proposals that you refer to are not yet uh, available, not because we're sitting on our hands, but because we have 2,400 volunteers on our experience panel. We have a number of stakeholder groups, and we do in fact have a disability and carers benefit expert group, uh, very well chaired by uh, Dr. McCormick. And our commitment is to engage in consultation with them at every step in the process. That is what we're doing indeed. Uh, beginning in January, we will be actively engaging with them in the, the early part uh, of the uh, programme in terms of the IT infrastructure for those benefits. So as we do that work, we will undoubtedly reach particular policy decisions which will inform the draft regulations, and I think I've already committed uh, in the Chamber and at this committee to the super affirmative process, and we will bring forward amendments on that, as I have said. Um, we have also committed, indeed, we came to this committee and suggested that the, you give some consideration to the uh, proposition of independent scrutiny. Uh, I've committed absolutely to that in a statutory basis and made the additional commitment that uh, Scottish Government ministers, unlike UK ministers, should be required to consult that committee. In terms of what the Scottish Fiscal Commission does, that um, has already been agreed um, through a proper process in this Parliament about what its remit is, how it operates uh, and how it functions. And if uh, the Parliament wishes to um, put any further duties on it, then my suggestion is that is for the Parliament uh, and not for me as Social Security Minister. Would, 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 you, would you welcome, or would you seek to resist, or would you hold your position um, on, um, uh, on the idea that the Fiscal Commission is um, legally obliged to assist the Parliament in this way, rather than merely hopes to assist the Parliament in this way? Okay. The, the first part of it sounded like the beginning of a Christmas game, right? Um, uh, I think the Fiscal Commission, uh, at, like our own analysts in Scottish Government, uh, have uh, a degree of difficulty in forecasting when the baseline figure is not known. You know, I, I answered earlier, I think, Mr. Mr. Balfour's question about it's difficult to forecast if you do not know how many people currently receive X or Y. Therefore, uh, that was around uh, benefit take-up. And unfortunately, in terms of some of the baseline figures that you may want to start from, DWP either does not collect those or does not hold them on anything other than a UK basis. Yeah. So I completely understand why the Fiscal Commission would say we aim to. Uh, and until we can establish uh, more clearly where our, what our baseline is, then I think that their position at the moment is an entirely reasonable and fair one. Whether or not the Parliament wants them to move beyond that is, of course, as I've said, for the Parliament to determine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I bring Ms McNeill in? Yeah, um, Minister, you did cover this earlier, and I just wanted to be sure I've, I've understood it. Now, this is in relation to, I think it was Mark Griffin's question about um, uptake in benefits. So, at this point in time, um, discussions are ongoing and, uh, and a future date, the Scottish Government, the new agency, will take responsibility for the delivery of, of the benefits that are currently reserved. So, if more people, if there's a campaign where people take their benefits that previously weren't, why would the Scottish, did you say that the Scottish Government have to pick that up? Surely, if more people are claiming their benefits that would have been entitled to them, then that would form the basis of a discussion between the Scottish Government and the, and the UK Government uh, under the fiscal framework as being the, as being the true baseline for, benefit, for those benefits. I just wanted to be sure about mm. that. So, so uh, absolutely um, fair question. So it, it depends uh, at the point where people 
where there is an uptake in a particular benefit, who has responsibility for that benefit? So, um, we have committed, and you'll know, um, and we're due indeed to have a discussion, um, with your, I am with yourself and Mr Griffin, on the benefit uptake campaign mm -hmm. and the, um, the improvement to that work so that it is a shared campaign between local and Scottish Government. Uh, following the roundtables that we've already had. Um, and we're committed to doing that in the lifetime of this parliament. What a future government does is, of course, for that future government. Um, and that the, the intention there is exactly that. It's to uh, alert people to look at what they might be entitled to, particularly people who are in work, uh, who mm -hmm. may presume uh, that because they are in employment, they are not entitled to some benefits when, uh, depending on uh, the nature of their employment and particularly the income level and other responsibilities they might have, they may well indeed be entitled to additional fi financial support. And then to point them towards um, where to get advice and, and how to secure that. Uh, and we will focus on particular benefits as well, where we know that there is a low uptake. So, for example, we have uh, focused on uh, attendance allowance, uh, where, where what figures that do exist do show us that there is um, a low uptake uh, compared to those who are entitled to it. Now, in terms of if you are successful in increasing the numbers of people um, receiving what they're entitled to, who pays that? Clearly, if it's a reserved benefit, then that... That is a, a cost to the UK government, uh, and it would continue to be a reserve benefit and, and so on. If it is a devolved benefit, any one of the 11, then um, whether or not that additional cost falls to the Scottish government or to the UK government depends on where we are in the um, transfer of right. responsibility over the next three years. Uh, and uh, if it is at that point a benefit for which uh, the Scottish Government is responsible and the numbers uh, who are entitled to that uh, claim it, uh, if that, those numbers increase, then that is an additional cost to the Scottish Government. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just thought I'd check. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one clarification. Oh, clarify away. On you go. One, one clarification you might want to get, or, or, or I will now give, um, is um, that the, there's a comparison that needs to go on between what happens for the, reserve, the, the element of the benefit that remains reserved in the rest of the UK. So um, if uptake rises in Scotland but, and does not rise in our UK, then the Scottish Government would have to meet that cost. If uptake rises in Scotland yes. and rises in our UK, then there will be a block grant, there will be adjustment to the block grant. There will be consequentials as, as a result of the increased UK Government spending, um, and then Scotland would get the money. That's quite an important clarification, mm -hmm. because <laughs> if you run a campaign in Scotland and the uptake rises and you don't run a campaign in England and Wales, then naturally there's likely to be a higher uptake, is there not, in Scotland? Uh, that would seem reasonable, yeah. I'm, I'm more than happy, Ms McNeil, to run the campaign south of the border as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh. OK, well, I'm, I'm clear about what you're saying. I just, I'm, 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 sh I'm sure you'll speak up for yourself for the negotiations, I'm sure of that. But uh, it just seems a little bit unfair if those benefits would have been, those are benefits that people are entitled to and at that point in time would still be technically reserved until such point as the Scottish Government takes full responsibility for that under the agency, seems obvious to me that that should be paid for by the UK Government until such times as the Scottish agency takes full responsibility for one of those 11 benefits. Yeah, the unfairness of it uh, is not something I'm going to disagree with you on in terms of, you know, that, that you would hope that um, both the UK government and the Scottish government would be encouraging individuals who are entitled to financial support to claim that financial support and secure it. Um, I, I am not responsible for, nor able to direct the UK government, more is a pity, um, I'm only responsible for what we do here, and we will do the right thing and encourage people to secure the financial support they're entitled to. Thank you very much. 
you. Um, Minister, in your opening statement, you mentioned the letter that was sent to the Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny uh, Committee mm -hmm. regarding um, some clarification on the IT issues. Obviously, IT issues can be um, of concern and, and we should be learning the lessons of, of failures from the past. My understanding is that part of the issue with the DWP is that it's very disparate IT systems that in layman's terms don't talk to one another. So I was wondering if you could, uh, or your officials could elaborate on what the, IG, the agile development model that's been adopted will do to, to um, ensure that some of those problems aren't repeated, but also about the scalability going forward for the social security system and how that, um, that the decision to follow that um, meets with the best value principles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if I could just say a, f a couple of things to start with. Uh, I, I think the, it's important um, to repeat that the approach that we've taken um, to IT is entirely consistent with the advice from Audit Scotland, um, who have been consistent in their advice in terms of learning lessons, that uh, what you don't do is a big banner approach, that you um, grow a new service like this one in manageable chunks. Um, I'm sure they put it better, but in man essentially in manageable chunks. Um, so that takes us right back to uh, what I've consistently said about um, you, you design it, you build it, you test it, you deliver it, and then you repeat. Uh, and so as we deliver uh, each, take responsibility and deliver each benefit incrementally, we are learning, uh, so, and the learning uh, from the first is applied to the second and so on. Uh, and uh, our um, approach uh, on uh, the IT build absolutely replicates that, uh, the various stages. Uh, and in the design stage, uh, of course, the design and the test stages are where uh, our experience panels are particularly uh, helpful to us. Um, and indeed, uh, in some of the, uh, in, a, in a smaller way, but nonetheless an important way uh, in terms of learning, uh, we can point to having already done that with the introduction of our uh, flexibilities in terms of universal credit, um, where the, um, how that system would work for uh, Scottish residents in receipt of universal credit, where it would come in um, to the stage in terms of their claim at assessment period two, and what they would then see uh, on their screens and what they would be asked to do, um, was all uh, followed that approach in terms of design and test in order to make sure that uh, everything was as clear as possible and people understood what they were being asked, to do, what they were being offered, what they were being asked to do and what the consequences of, of that uh, were. And members will be aware that we've now read the, laid the regulations to extend those universal credit choices to uh, individuals who were already on full service universal credit. Uh, on the specifics of uh, what you asked, I'm going to ask Mr Wallace to take us through those. Yeah, thank, um, I'm happy to do so. Um, so I, I, I think, um, I'll remind myself of your question, you asked primarily about agile um, and about best value. So as, as the Minister says, we're, we're learning the lessons of, of past IT projects and we're, we're taking due account of, of Audit Scotland reports. It's their, their principles for a digital, digital future report, um, which says that we should break complex IT programs up into manageable stages. Um, so as an iterative approach, for, as it's an iterative approach to the devolution of social security power, so is, a, is it an iterative approach to the design and build of our system. Um, so we build it in stages, essentially. The letter that we, we copied to the Public Audit um, Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee had the, the breakdown of the, the 190 million uh, committee members will recall from the financial memorandum to the social security bill that we we described implementation costs at, at a total of, of £308 million. Um, within that, the largest component of that 308 was the, the £190 million for, for IT, um, which was our estimate at the time, our initial high-level estimate of, of what it could possibly cost to design and build a system for the, for the entire social security system. Um, the, the, the agile approach is a... Is a 
uh, well-established, well-developed methodology. Um, it follows a, a number of, of phases, discovery, um, alpha, beta, live, um, and it's a, there's, there's sort of ongoing user testing through that process. Um, you, members may also be aware that, that we've recently let the first contract for the Wave 1 benefits um, to IBM uh, UK Limited um, for uh, the sort of design and build of the capabilities that were required to deliver the first wave um, of, of benefits. Um, in terms of the process that we've gone through to get to that contract award, um, uh, before we make any investment, we, there'll be a, a business case created. We follow the, the Treasury's five case model um, to describe sort of the, the strategic case for change, the socioeconomic case, the financial case, the management case. Um, and we go through and we link the potential costs with the, with the benefits and the outcomes that we expect to achieve, um, specifically in relation to the, the low income benefit uh, contract award, um, the, the, the way that system will be developed in, in the agile way um, is through statements of work. So the, the total contract is, is a fixed price and we will not go over that price. Um, but statements of work will be given to us and agreed between uh, the between us as the client and the and the supplier. And um, we will say what, what what stage are you at? What, what are you going to build for us? What capabilities are you going to deliver? Exactly how much is that going to cost? Um, and then after each stage of that, we will look back at the statement of work and say exactly what did you deliver? What what, what did it cost? Um, and calculate or, or balance those two issues off together to say, did we achieve what we expected to achieve? Do we need to take some kind of action to, to intervene here with the, with the supplier to ensure that we're, we're delivering what we expected to deliver, to ensure, to ensure the capabilities are right, to ensure that we're securing value for the public purse? Um, this is a, a major complex system that, that we're <coughs> going to end up with. So um, I think it's wholly appropriate that we take that approach to make sure that we're protecting the public purse. Um, and that is the approach we're going to continue to take throughout the programme. Can, can I just make a, a couple of other points just about um, how, how this thing works and, and um, it may be a, Mr Lockhart will want to add something uh, to that but um, I think it's quite important I've spoken before I think at this committee about how uh, inside the Social Security Directorate the teams are working in that our teams are integrated so we do not have in one corner policy teams and another delivery teams and uh, so on and so forth, but they are integrated around particular benefits. So there is a low-income benefits team that incorporates all the different uh, skills and areas of expertise that you would expect to see, um, so that we are, we are sure as we go forward that what may be a good policy proposition is deliverable, or what may be a, a delivery issue um, uh, can be accommodated within policy thinking and development. It's probably the best way to describe it. Similarly, in this contract with IBM UK, they are, they are not away in a different place uh, working to our specification. They are working with our teams so that they are integrated as part of that process. That allows us um, to, be, uh, um, to be agile ourselves, I guess, uh, and to uh, understand as you go through each uh, piece of work within that contract, uh, what what the issues are and resolve them as you go and provide the information that Mr Wallace was describing. Um, I don't know, Mr Lockhart, if you want I, to add I anything answered to that. It perfectly. Uh, oh. I, I, IBM are on site, uh, coin a phrase, they're in bed with us. They're, they're part of the delivery teams. The teams are made up of user research, policy, security, technical developers, uh, business areas, so they're all embedded in these core teams and they work through the agile sprints, stage by stage, and as Mr Wallace had said, these sprints are broken up to clear statements of work which are agreed, for, agreed by the Scottish Government and IBM accordingly. That's very helpful and th thank you for the answer. Um, you know, um, I think the concern for the committee is that on that day one of switchover that no one is left, not in receipt of their benefits that they're entitled to and we don't have any of those delays, so thank you very much for that. Are there any further questions or supplementaries? Mr Balfour? Uh, Again, just looking forward, uh, Minister, in regard to the new agency uh, and the staff that will work in that agency, um, will they be to pay the cost from hmm. DWP, or will they be new people who are brought in at first, or will it be a mixture? And, and what discussions are going on with DWP in regard to that? And secondly, and 
I just for clarification, Matt, um, I used to be a member of the tribunal services. Obviously, there are appeals in regard to the different benefits that go to tribunals. At the moment, they sit with the Ministry of Justice. Will they be, again, to feed across those that sit on tribunals to your department or to a different department of the Scottish Government? And again, what discussions are going on with um, the UK Government around those as well? OK, if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I can answer the last, the last one first. The, um, uh, there is a, a devolution of tribunal responsibilities, I think, as you know. Uh, that sits with Ms Ewing's portfolio, uh, and uh, that includes the Social Security okay. Tribunal. Um, uh, and I'm sure that if the committee wanted clarification uh, from her about how that work is progressing, then she would be more than happy uh, to give that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and she and I have discussed, have discussed that and have also discussed where we might need an interim position uh, as the, the devolution of tribunals um, process goes forward, uh, we may be a little bit ahead of it. So we need to have an interim solution. But um, she'd be more than happy, I'm sure, to give you details on that. Uh, on the question of uh, CHUPI, or um, for public sector, I believe it's COSOP, um, uh, our officials are having detailed discussions with uh, the DWP on that uh, and where the, uh, po the jobs that we require uh, fit into that category uh, in as much as DWP currently uh, have those similar roles uh, for the benefits that we will take responsibility for, then of course as a government we have an absolute commitment to follow that process. Uh, my anticipation uh, in terms of the overall numbers of jobs that uh, will be required in Scotland is that that number that would fall into that category will be relatively small. Uh, and, uh, but our officials are working through the detail, um, both in terms of the posts that will be based in Glasgow and Dundee, and those based across local authorities. And as that work progresses, then we will keep this committee informed about um, how we are refining through the total number of 1,500 between Glasgow and Dundee and around 400 uh, locally based social security staff. Uh, but as I said, um, our uh, expectation is that the numbers of posts that would fall under uh, COSOP will be relatively small. And my understanding is that uh, certainly for um, the first benefit in terms of carers allowance supplement, uh, that does not apply. Okay, thank you. OK. Um, I think on that note, Minister, um, thank you very much for your attendance. I think we've strayed a little bit from budget into implementation, but thank you very much for your comprehensive answers. And I'm sure my colleagues will look forward to you getting back on the areas of clarification. But thank you very much and to your officials as well. And uh, I'll just suspend briefly and just wish you a very happy festive season. Thank you. Thank you. We will get back on those two specific issues uh, by close today and um, my very best wishes to all of you too. Thank you.
Um, if we could move to uh, agenda item two on subordinate legislation, it's consideration of whether to take evidence on the Universal Credit Claims and Payments Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 436. Um, this um, was mentioned by the, the Minister earlier, it's to give the um, options <coughs> provided to new universal claimant, claimants to existing universal claimants. And um, it's just to ask members if the evidence that's previously been taken in this year, that given that they are content to take no further ev evidence on this instrument. Everybody content with that? That's very helpful. Um, so we will consider the instrument at the meeting on the 18th of January. And on that note, we move into private session. Thank you.